Good evening. I'm, I'm Bob Carey. I'm president of the New School. Uh, this idea actually uh, came to uh, me thanks to Beavis Longstreth, um, who's uh, a trustee of the university, but he's also chairman of the audit committee, which means anything Beavis asked me to do, I do. Uh, <laughs> this turned out to be uh, uh, one of the things that Beavis asked me to do that, that was really, uh, I, I, I am quite excited about. Uh, some of them uh, have not been so good, but this one has been spectacular, uh, Beavis, because uh, we were able uh, to uh, visit Henriette Sir, who Beavis believes may be the, uh, our, our most important alumna of, of Parsons, uh, perhaps oldest living. Uh, living longer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, our, our provost and I uh, uh, met with her, and Joel Towers here, the, who's the dean of, of Parsons, uh, uh, picked up on the same thing, which is that uh, the writing and the work that uh, Henriette uh, did uh, 50 years ago is just as relevant today as it was 50 years ago. Uh, and the uh, Beavis has reported to me, and uh, in conversations that I've had with Henriette since, uh, uh, in addition to the obvious design talent, uh, there's an extraordinary work ethic that is impressive. Uh, 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 she's organized herself and prepared herself and, and most importantly made certain that we're prepared uh, for <laughs> this uh, conversation as well. Uh, I wanted to, do we have a, a, a handheld microphone? Because I'd like to ask uh, uh, Anna Marie Kellen. Uh, who uh, knows Henriette and knows uh, and Henriette's sister. They uh, met in uh, Paris in the 1930s, and that's one of the things that I will do at the beginning is try to set the stage uh, to talk a bit about Paris in the 30s and the world uh, in the 1930s, because the University in Exile uh, is among our most important uh, stories, the New School's most important stories, and that uh, uh, began uh, the day after the National Socialist Party were, were elected and came to power in January 1933. Uh, uh, Anna Marie and, and uh, uh, her husband, Stephen uh, Kellen, uh, made a, a gift, uh, and Anna Marie's got a relationship with Parsons as well, but made a gift, uh, uh, and the result of that gift is that we now have the Kellen archives, and our dean uh, has actually retrieved a speech, and we'll reference that speech and later this evening, that uh, Henry Etkeb in 1961 from the Kellen archives, they're stored in the Kellen archives, and I told Anna Marie earlier that uh, unfortunately she's only seen the uh, Kellen auditorium once, uh, but it is uh, our most beautiful auditorium, uh, most beautiful room at the, at the university, it, it was designed by Lynn Rice uh, and his team. Uh, and also, as Joel said, most functional. It is, Anna Maria, a place when you go inside, you immediately want to either be a student or a professor. It, it, it feels like a room where one ought to either teach or learn. So I uh, want to, on behalf of, of our university, and Parsons in particular, thank you and Stephen for that gift, because it uh, has done, is doing, and will do a tremendous amount of good. Uh, Anna Maria asked and uh, prepared a, a sort of an introductory statement for uh, Henry at this evening. I was invited to give this little speech because I'm probably the only person alive today who knew Henriette when she was a teenager. We met in Paris in the 30s. Her sister and I were best friends and do you two years younger than Harry Henriette. This age difference allowed her to look down on us. <laughs> and needless to say, we looked up to her. As you can see, we kept in touch for over more than seven decades, during which our friendship grew. The list of her achievements, as you know, is very, very long. I can only sum her up by saying that everything she touched turned out to be extraordinary. Whether it was her career as consultant and interior designer or her passion for her garden. I'm sure that many of you remember the exquisite taste she brought to the model rooms at Bloomingdale's 
the first of their kind. But I was also like to mention her mother's contribution to success. She handed down the elegance, good taste, and talent to her daughters. I'm profoundly proud to call Henriette my friend. Your voice was spectacular. <laughs> Your voice was spectacular. Oh. Yes. Uh, well, Henry, I mean, as I indicated, I'm going to let Joel uh, focus a bit more on design, although I'll probably break that promise as the evening goes on. And for the audience's uh, understanding, we'll, we'll talk till about 7 and then uh, uh, open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, and then at uh, 7.30, uh, the program will end. So, uh, Henriette, we, we, the, the 30s were uh, uh, an extraordinary time, and your family came here in 1937 first, and you... For a trip. For one, you know, for just a trip. Well, rather than me trying to put uh, much focus on that, just talk about the 30s and the importance of the 30s in your own uh, words about the impact that it may have had on your design sensibilities. Well, uh, I probably should say, you know, how it came to Parsons. Now, Parsons, uh, at that time, had a tiny, tiny school in Paris on a very famous square, which was called the Place de Vosges, which is one of the most exquisite uh, Louis XIII squares in Paris, and it still is preserved. And it was run by two gentlemen. Uh, who really lived in New York, but uh, he spent a lot of time in Paris. And, uh, the, you know, I was born in Vienna, and we moved as teenager to Paris, and we had a terrible time. Uh, we spoke a bit of English, but obviously you had to speak French in school if you wanted to get to school, you know, schooling. And that was a catastrophe. So my mother met these two gentlemen that owned the school, the Randa School in Paris, on a cruise in Egypt. I mean, the world is round, and so, uh, and uh, with that, you know, and apparently she came back and you know heard they had a school, so she went to look at the school where they were teaching fashion and interior design. So she said to you know us, well, maybe that's what you could do. So we went to Parsons. We didn't know anything about the school. And so, so I went to the interior department. My sister went to the fashion department. And this is about all the, the real education I ever got, because you know we were pretty young. And the only thing is that at that time, I think, that uh, the school was teaching rather one, te one taught different, you know, subjects, you know, in, uh, at that time. And the big emphasis for that school, which was very special, was that if you didn't get yourself a classic education, you could not possibly continue being or become a good designer. You, we, for two years, we did nothing but to and try to study the old style. I mean, would it be the French, the Greek, uh, or whatever was you know out there? Uh, because they felt if we did not have a classic background, we could not continue being successful in that field eventually. And I have no idea. I must admit, you know, what you teach today. But I suppose there is still some of it, you know, I w would presume. And uh, that has naturally left an enormous impact on me. And the other thing, which uh, obviously is probably less of an importance today, because you all have a computer. Well, that didn't exist. And it's very, you know, when you think that I was a totally grown-up person, in the middle of my life, basically, 
when one, one heard about the first computer, which was the IBM computer, which was as big as this room. And today you are you know, running around with that little thing here that can do anything. It telephones, it, it takes pictures, it, you know, so. And so, so then another thing we had to learn is to learn how to draw. And we spend an enormous amount of time drawing because it, it was sort of a very strange thing for a lot of people that had enormous amount of talents, talents but really couldn't draw very well because that was the time when there was hardly any color photography. There was, you know, all the fashion magazines used people to sketch clothes. You know, for instance, Vogue magazine was full of very good uh, artists that drew pictures. And so that was the great emphasis in the school, is to learn classics and to learn how to draw. Because today, you know, then, you know, which probably is very difficult for the younger people here to understand, when you sold a job as a decorator, you had to draw a picture, a perfect perspective of that room with every single you know, chair in place, and it had to be that Louis XV chair or that modern chair. It couldn't just be a chair. And you couldn't come like today, you have a floor plan, and then you come with a swatch that's two inches by two inches, and you try to sell a sofa. That didn't exist. <laughs> so, you know, basically our education was, you know, that was that. But what, and, talk about this, the, I mean, the depression was global. The war was global, and it seemed... Well, that came, ba that came then, you know, you know, a little later. But there's a big explosion of design and uh, after the war. And there well, was... after the war, yes. And then, actually, we have lived, and it is very difficult for some of you to really understand the atmosphere. Now, at that time, I was in the United States here. Yeah. And I had had no problem getting jobs because I had gone to Parsons and I knew, you know, about certain things. And the where you were where every single day that there was a war out there. Now we are today fighting, you know, a few wars too. And I think unless you have a relative or a son or a cousin who is today, you know, in the army or somewhere fighting abroad, you would not know that there's a war going on. So it was a time then in the 40s, now we are in the, in the 40s, uh, where there was an austerity, there was nothing available, and, uh, you know, one may do. And I think the big time, the exciting times that happened right after the war then was this complete explosion of talent that for 10 years nearly has been sitting there all over the world in, you know, in Italy and Scandinavia and everywhere uh, without being you know, explored. And this it was you know, some of the very exciting times you know, in, in, you know, the design field, in the fashion field, you know, one started traveling. And because of, you know, this very restrained, you know, time that we had during the war years, and I'm quite sure it was true everywhere, you know, through the world. So uh, let me, let me, um, you, your work was so path-breaking in so many different ways uh, in terms of the introduction of a modern aesthetic uh, into interior uh, design and into the homes of so many people around this country, and in, in many ways, as a, uh, through media, therefore, as an explosion beyond that, you drew, drew from Europe, but it also goes um, out from America. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit what, about what it was like, not just to be uh, at the front edge and identifying um, these new trends in design, but also as a woman doing that, because you were breaking boundaries as well uh, in, in that way. And so if you could talk a little bit about what it was like also in this period of time to be at the front. 
Well, by accident, you know, because, uh, you know, when I, for instance, got to Macy's, I started first in the decorating department, you know, drawing, you know, all day long, you know, for the top decorator there. And then, obviously, more and more the war started and people were drafted. And Macy's maintained uh, the idea during the war years that we had to put on a very, very good front, you know, get people, trying to get people in the store and make a great effort, you know, although things were very, it was very difficult and things were not easily available. But uh, I was uh, to run the decorating department and I had about 90 people working for me. And every, you know, every window had to be fixed up every constantly and things. And I was the first woman that ever held down that job because, uh, you know, just that's the way it was, right? And, uh, you know, after the war, I must say I had to give it up because everybody that came back from the war that wanted their jobs back got their jobs back. <laughs> so we were out of a job. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so how long did it take them to understand their grave mistake and put you back in charge? Well, they never did put me back in charge. No. No, 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 I left Macy's at that time. Yes. And then I went to work actually for a quite remarkable, you know, a remarkable store that was Lord and Taylor under Dorothy Schaefer. So for a short time before I, you know, moved on to Bloomingdale's. So. You said uh, uh, to me earlier and uh, a few weeks ago when we, when we talked that you almost lived in two worlds. Um, the world of William, your husband, the artist and restorer, and then the world of your work. Um, well, it, it was naturally two worlds. You know, I was deeply involved in, it was a commercial world. It was a wonderful world because I think, uh, you know, I was working in the in one of the best fields that you can work with if you're interested in you know, ethics and in uh, making that world a better place and a prettier place and a healthier place. And uh, through you know, having met uh, Billy Sur, who was steeped, who was an artist and steeped in, you know, deeply in the world of just about the best there is out there. You know, he was a, for the ones that have not heard of him or known him, he ended up probably as one of the best, uh, they are now called conservators and they were called restorers of paintings. And he was able, he worked for practically every big museum in the United States because at that time, uh, the museums did not have their own uh, restorers. And uh, he worked uh, for, uh, you know, he worked for the big collections, for every, every collector here in the United States, for the dealers. And he was one of the very few who worked for collectors and some of the, the big dealers such as Duveen and uh, Agnew, you know, this, the Agnew in England, uh, Nerdless here. And he had naturally, so uh, during the day, I was uh, debating, you know, would it, what we should we do and what can we do to sell a little bit more merchandise here. And at night, one discussed Rembrandt, right? So it was, <laughs> you know, I had sort of the best of two worlds. But also time. during the year, didn't you and Billy uh, take sort of regular trips abroad? Yes, we did, because when I came to Bloomingdale's, I, you know, I came as a fashion coordinator for the home furnishing division and was responsible for all the presentations throughout the store and strange enough for the main store too because uh, my immediate boss happened to have both these divisions to, to take care of. And uh, I told them that I would not work in July and August. And uh, that I would get my big shows ready. I had to do four a year. And, but, I, but I would be happily wherever, if anybody wanted me to do something for them over the in Europe, I'll go. I, all they had to do is pay me for my expenses the days. And 
You see, I, you know, I'm going to use a, a very much abused word here. Uh, I was in the right place at the right time with the right boss, because the big boss in Bloomingdale's at that time was sort of a rarity. Because obviously, you know, you have seen, you've all been in stores, you've been in department stores, and you do know that money is made with ready to wear. It is not made with furniture. And the best, you know, furniture, home furnishings, basically, unless you are really a specialty, uh, have a specialty, you know, shop in between. Because it's very easy to explain, you know, you take a sofa, a big sofa, how much room it takes up. It takes 10 people to move it on the floor. It takes 10 people to move it off. Then people order a special color, and that takes two months before it, eight months before it gets delivered. Well, you can sell a thousand dresses in the same thing, and they take the dress home, and you get your money in the bank. So, uh, so he happened to be a home furnishing man. So he, you know, I could do really what I wanted to do. And who was he? Uh, Jed Davidson. And uh, so he was, uh, you know, he, obviously there were a few over the years, you know, too. But basically, they usually all used to start out at least with ready to wear. But you, so, you, so you traveled though, you and Billy traveled, and you say you traveled to learn. Uh, well, we traveled because uh, we, you know, uh, Billy's work to, you know, all took him basically. First, it was too hot in New York, so that started that. <laughs> and then uh, it uh, basically, we, uh, you know, we just traveled all over the place. I must admit, I've 30 times consecutively been in Venice because it was one of our most favorite places. For how long a period were you in Venice? Ten get, days. Ten days? Thirty straight years. Thirty straight years. <laughs> two of two only, two rooms only, always in but, the same hotel. But so. did that did did either of the and I won't ask any questions about that. <laughs> uh, did, did did either the experience of uh, spending a large amount of time in Paris uh, and the travel that it affect your your, your eye, your design sensibility. Well, absolutely, because, you know, don't forget, that was the time, especially in the uh, beginning of the, uh, the 50s, you know, 54, for instance, 57, there were the great shows in Europe. There was the uh, Triennale in Milan, where all the countries who had something to offer, you know, showed their best wear. And, uh, and this is where really the beginning of the influence from all the different countries that, again, had been pent up too. Now, there were wonderful things that happened around here. Because, for instance, my first set of rooms uh, that uh, I was, as, you know, I did was in 1949 uh, when I came to Bloomingdale's. And uh, there was already very, very little contemporary furniture available in this country. Very, very little. And uh, this is how we started, you know, because, again, it is very difficult to, for any of you to uh, even fathom that, for instance, towels, you know, bath towels existed, I think, in five, six colors. That was all there was. If you wanted anything else, you had to have it custom made. Broadloom, plain carpet, existed in four colors, in dark green, in dark red, beige, and gray. That was it. <laughs> so suddenly, even here in this country, suddenly came you know, an enormous amount of desire you know, to do different things and to show different things. And, and the influence, naturally, from traveling and seeing different things, and especially uh, the you know the big boss, Mr. Davidson, uh, he adored France. And on his vacation every year, he went <clears throat> to France mainly. And he was, used to come back and says, "Now I saw something very interesting. They are showing some provincial prints." So I said, "Okay." We'll go and look where they come from. So I went to Tarascon and saw Mr. Desmarais, 
who had one of the oldest, uh, you know, which today the fabrics are still being sold here in New York, actually. And uh, so one thing he came back and said, uh, there's a wonderful exhibit of uh, fab fabrics from India. Go to India. Just pack up, go to India. Huh? <laughs> go to India. So, uh, uh, and investigate the merchandise over there. So I came back with no, no, me, was don't, 1955. Don't, don't, don't come back yet. But tell me about the trip to India. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's again luck. One has to have luck in, in life. That was the time when nobody really knew what to do or where to go, you know, to, to even start finding out something. Uh, so it so happened that in spring that year, before Mr. Davidson told me to go to India, uh, somebody who became a friend, Mr. Baker, who ran the best furniture company in the United States, is fine furniture, good furniture in Grand Rapids. Then all the furniture was made in Grand Rapids, the good furniture, not in the South, where it is made now. Uh, said, uh, you know, he called me up and said, there's a very nice gentleman uh, that uh, came to my office to show me some fabrics here. That, impossible to be used. Can't You can't use them. I can't use them. But he's coming to New York. Be nice to him. He's a nice gentleman. So came this very, very impressive gentleman who happened to be a Sikh. I didn't know a Sikh from, you know, anybody else. But now we do know that there were turbans. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so he came to my office with somebody carrying a bag. And here were these fabrics. And obviously, one couldn't. Impossible. It was very nice. I took him to lunch, and uh, and that was it. And suddenly, two weeks later, I received a telephone call. His name was Mohan Singh. Mr. Mohan is inviting you for dinner at the Hotel Statler, if anybody remembers, which one really wasn't a very fashionable hotel at the, you know at that time at near Pennsylvania Station. So I went there for dinner, and who was there? James Farley was the representative, the vice president of Coca-Cola International. There were three vice presidents from Pfizer, and he went on with the whole thing. Well, it turned out that Mohan had, was, he owned the Coca-Cola concessions in India, he, he, he represented Pfizer, he, you know, he was, you know, well, lo and behold, I'm going to India two months later. <laughs> so first I went here to the consulate and told them, you know, who I am and I'm going. And I said, now, you know, I only know the Coca-Cola man, but maybe you can make arrangements for me when I get over there because that's, we are looking for merchandise that we can import. So I must say my trip to India was really quite extraordinary. There was, by the way, the only thing Mr. Davidson told me, I was supposed to be away July and August. You have to be back October 1st. <laughs> go when you want, do what you want, just go. So no it was, the monsoon was on, no air condition. There was water up to here in the streets in Delhi. But there was Mohan, who, you know, with big garlands at the airport and everything else. And I must say the consulate, you know, had, you know, made arrangements for me to meet some wonderful people in all different states, you know, in between. Uh, I started out in Delhi. So, you know, I saw we went to Kashmir, and, and India at that time had just, you know, basically 47, it got a bit independence and uh, started out and they had made an enormous effort and run by some of the big families, the well-to-do families in, in India, uh, to set up what they called emporiums that still exist today, where they had accumulated all their wonderful handicrafts, you know, from each of the region, because obviously in Kashmir they made lacquer and certain embroideries. There, may, there was a lot of textile industry in Madras and, you know, in Bombay. And 
and it, it was run beautifully, but everything was in the beginning. Uh, and so, and the people, the, the, the families I met were all wonderful. And among them, I met uh, the cousin of Mr. Nehru, who then was fin uh, finance minister of uh, India. And we were invited in their houses. We were exceedingly well, well treated, and it was just wonderful. And I, you know, and Mohan, please, by the way, was in the construction business. He had built just the American embassy that Stone had, uh, you know, designed. And then he, uh, besides that, he was selling armaments, and he was, <laughs> he was a gentleman that came from a village someplace, a real village. And he liked his fresh milk. He was a vegetarian. So in front of his place of business, they had the cow that came down every day that was tied up right in the middle of Delhi. So I suppose these things have changed a bit. But uh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's still going on. So that was the kind of thing. So it's hard to follow that story with a serious question about color. But I want to do it anyway, because you and I talked about it. And I'd like to think that Parsons um, uh, taught you some things, but I clearly, it's clear that the travel also played a role in your understanding of the world and in the training of your eye. But one of the early reviews of your work, and you know, your work I, attracted the, the attention of people like Edgar, Edgar Kaufman from, from MoMA, yeah. from uh, the Frick. I mean, it's, it really became a, a statement of, in its own right. But one of the things that distinguished the work is your use of color. In fact, there's a very nice review in the New York Times. I, uh, it's been great pleasure to read through all of these uh, stories and, and learning about this work. There was a review in the New York Times um, that talked about the way in which your work distinguished modernism as it was often understood by architects of that time, who often forgot about the color in their work, and the way you brought it in to your displays. And I'm curious where that came from. Is it part of, these, is it part of the journeys? Where, does, where did you train your eye for color, and how did you integrate it, and what were you thinking about? Uh, well, I do believe that I have, in the first place, I found out, you know, that why I was as successful the way I was putting things together, because I can think three-dimensional, which an awful lot of people cannot do. Yeah. They can do, put together some, you know, very good work and do things, but, uh, um, you know, it, it doesn't sound right to say things about oneself, but I don't think I've ever made a mistake because I mainly worked with big areas. You know, I, I was laying out furniture floors. I was, uh, I did very few interiors. I did some, but not very many. And uh, I, you know, I just always could, you know, conceive, you know, what it would look like. And, uh, you know, it probably is a matter of just natural thing, you know, it was, it's, there. It, it was there. And I, uh, you know, was able, to, you know, and this, I think, my, you know, exhibits that I did more than interiors. For instance, the Scandinavian show, which was the first uh, uh, Scandinavian show in a commercial place, you know, there where uh, the skin when, after the war again, the, the four Scandinavian governments had a very active uh, official, uh, you know, area set up where actually they promoted. You know, it's not the manufacturers that had to go out and promote themselves. It is the governments mm -hmm. did it in a very elegant and very good good way. And, but again, I, when I was doing the thing, you know, when I brought the thing, uh, you know, over here, uh, I set up a, you know, I mixed everything together. And I just could always make the things look good. And uh, for instance, the, I have a letter from, you know, I think some of you know who Edgar Kaufman was. And probably his greatest, you know, he was probably one of the most influential people you know, because he started being interested in contemporary things, good contemporary things, already in the uh, in the 30s, yes. 40s, and 
I must say, you know, he started the, uh, the good design objects that was sort of a new idea uh, to try to show objects that were made contemporary objects that people were not used to see that were commercially available. And that was under the auspices of the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, one store in each city was allowed to show that merchandise. And we had at that time, you know, it was in the beginning, you know, the first show that uh, was uh, actually, first time it was shown was in 51. And we got, we were the store that he selected. And I will tell you, you know, a funny story. He, he, and, you know, we were a department store, right? And people were not used to have sort of kind of museums looking things in a department store. So whatever I did, I pasted everything down so that people couldn't pick up the plate and <laughs> carry it over there so it stayed neat. So, you know, Mr. Kaufman, who was not, you know, he was always very reserved, you know, walks through the, this was the way I met Edgar. And by the way, we got to be fast friends till the end of his life. Mm. And he is the one that took me to falling water. And this is probably where you would probably know, which is today a house. And by the way, one of the trustees of the falling water happens to be here. And, uh, you know, I checked with him there. Last year, 162,000 people went through that house. It is probably the most photographed. I mean, he commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright for his father to build that house. So Edgar, you know, you know, was Mr. Kaufman, walks with me through the show and said, you know, very nice, very nice. But, he said, now, we were only allowed to show things that were, you know, that he selected, nothing else. And among other things, for instance, was a set of dishes that were stoneware, which was hardly ever used at that time. Everything was porcelain. And uh, so we are a store, right? And Mr. Kaufman had selected a plate, two plates, and a, a bowl. And there was no cup. Now, how can you try to sell in a department store <laughs> some dishes that don't even have the plate, a cup, one cup? So he said, Miss Granville, uh, you have to remove that cup. I do not approve of the design of the handle. <laughs> so that was pasted down. So Mr. Kaufman <laughs> was leaving. So I decided the one thing, that handle, it's just going to stay there on display. <laughs> so he forgave me later because we got the show again the following year. And, you know, so this story stayed in Finland as a joke between us for many years afterwards. So, so. If, the, if we go from, from good design to timeless design, because I think there's a link there. Yeah. And I, I, this is, Bob mentioned earlier that there were some documents that we found. And, you wrote something here that I want to read, um, both because it's beautiful, but uh, also because it could have been written today um, about the challenges that designers face. And you're introducing Gibbons here. And I, I just wanted to read now, this. Now, Rob for, John Gibbons, tell him a little bit about well, that. Well, I'm going to let you tell the story of your relationship because I, and, and who he is. I, it's, a, it's a terrific okay. story. But let me use your words to introduce it, and then you can tell us about him and what he had to say, because I think that um, it's so important for us as designers today not only to hear these words, but to figure out how to continue to take the challenges that you laid out in 1961 um, and make them relevant in the contemporary world. Uh, you, you say here, we've chosen today's subject, timeless design, because we, the committee, being very closely associated and working in and with the home furnishing industry as interior designers, writers, editors, stylists, firmly believe that obsolescence planned obsolescence and fads just do not belong in our houses and homes. Houses and homes should reflect the personality of their owners, should grow with them, should change with them over the years as their habits change and their tastes develop. I would like to state in a few words what we understand to be timeless design. And I want to ask you to speak a little bit about that, because it, in your statement is timeless. It's the same challenge to designers today not to fall prey to the easy questions of obsolescence and planned obsolescence. Now, this, 
this speech was uh, given, uh, rather I should say there is, was, what is today still, and it was a very important group of people that called themselves the fashion group. And who belongs to the fashion group uh, is everybody who has something to do with fashion. It could be the writers from Vogue, it could be all the designers, it could be the, the promoters, the, uh, the people that make fabric, and they're set, for instance, every year a color palette, what everybody should be trying to, you know, to uh, put together. And in about, uh, in, again, in the end of the 50s, home furnishing suddenly became stylish through some of the efforts, not only mine, but you know, a lot and a lot of people. And uh, they started what they called the home furnishing division, which, what, uh, and I was the chairman for two years. And what we had to uh, produce, what we had to produce, was a, a lunch, which was a fundraiser for them uh, once a year. And uh, there was this wonderful fellow called Rob Johnny Gibbings, who was in the design field, quite a character. He was an Englishman who was exceedingly elegant himself, uh, who did a lot of custom design, and uh, who was very opinionated about certain things. And uh, I had invited him, he became a very good friend of mine, and by the way, the first group of furniture that he made for a commercial, you know, for, the, for a very fine, uh, you know, the furniture company in the United States, because he only did custom furniture for mainly Texas and some very well-to-do people, uh, he gave me, you know, we got friends because he gave it to Bloomingdale's to introduce it. And that was true of Finn Yule, the famous Danish designer, and all the people that started doing were invited by commercial, you know, by good furniture company to uh, design for them. And every one of these people that never would have sold the furniture companies to Bloomingdale sold, you know, they came to us to show, you know, uh, their merchandise. And so, I got to know Finn Yule, I, you know, you know, and all these things because they all liked what, you know, what I was doing. Uh, so I had asked him to please come and talk. And it's a long talk, and I'm not going to read it all, but I will read a few things, yes. like because I do believe, like Joel here, that for the future. You know, I would like maybe the younger generation, maybe there are some of your students here or something, to think a little bit, uh, you know, about what, what Gibby said then, because I think it is true today. And uh, I'm just going to take, you know, a few things, you know, out here, you know, because it's long. And uh, eight years ago, I was in Egypt. And early one morning at Luxor, I crossed the Nile to see the Temple of Amun. The temple was designed 3,500 years ago by an architect named Senmud. Some parts of the building used for even more ancient religious ritual were in the academic Egyptian fashion of the period. But elsewhere, the plan and the forms transcend time and place. These forms are first of all beautiful, not just fashionably beautiful, admired by one generation and discarded by the next. Not just a national beauty, admired by one nation and mean, meaning less to all, and not meaning less to all others, but forms of an ageless and universal beauty. And then, you know, he is, uh, you know, uh, in the slides, well, he obviously showed slides. You later, you will see that timeless design has unique characteristic. You will see that it transcends national concepts of beauty. It appeals, it, it appeals is universal. You will also see that egomania and design should not be confused with true individuality. A designer whose sensibility is timeless and universal 
cannot use forms, material, or surface decoration that are only fashionable or erratic. But I think you will also see in timeless design one other magnificent quality, the quality of nobility. And he ends here. Here, in my opinion, is the great lesson of timeless design. The lesson the design should be noble because people are worthy of nobility. I say this because I see in some areas of design today the opposite. I see something very close to contempt for people. And I think this is a very, very true statement. Uh, I think, you know, I hope. And he ends up to say, I wonder sometimes if design today is standing at the crossroads. I wonder if the novelty of modernity is wearing out. Above all, I wonder what will replace it. Certain design values remain a source eternal, and wise people never less the awareness of them. Perhaps as never before, this is the moment to restate these values, not only for ourselves, but for the young generation who will be called in to design in the future. This I feel sure. Everyone here, designers, editors, reporters, observers, have the welfare of our environment in heart, which is another thing he started talking about. Because I think if we are not going to make all the effort that we possibly can, we are going to, you know, we've just ruined this world more and more and more. And I think we are even more at a crucial point today than this, you know, for 50 years ago. So this is something that I, you know, feel very strongly about. And obviously here, I didn't even know. We, did, we didn't rehearse this. We, we came they to both, these on our own, which was really. They both brought well, the same speech. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, there was a, a, a popular book in the late 50s called uh, Planned Obsolescence by, I think the author's name was Packard, and he actually stole it from a graduate student at Princeton, the idea, who happens to be a, well, a trustee well, of the University yes, of Bill Zabel. Yeah. Um, but it was, a, it was, you know, it was being done, uh, actually, intentionally planning something that would. Well, obsolescence, you know, right. this is basically what the fashion industry has always been promoting, that, you know, you should shed every single thing and uh, uh, which isn't necessary, you know, after all. I think probably the two of us here are good examples. We are having clothes on that, you know, uh, whereas it, this here is one of these wonderful things. I, you know, I had to wear one thing that, the, you know, the Siamese, uh, you know, the fabrics, the John T uh, Thompson, you know, revived after the war, after the, you know, the, you know, the, the World War in Thailand. And you know that is now 50 years old, and I suppose my suit probably <laughs> up is old too. Uh, and here is an old Roberta bag that they today sell you this antique somewhere. So you know, uh, not that we are not antiques, but uh, that's uh, that's right. So Tim, you've, you've used the expression a couple of times, and then and now in that in that lovely uh, speech, referring to design as nobility, noble design, and the opposite uh, demonstrating contempt for human beings. So what, what, when you see good furniture, what, what would cause you to say that's good? Well, I think it has to have, in the first, you know, somewhere it has to be uh, practical. And when I say practical, it has to have a, uh, a sense of that it can be used. And it should be base, you know, it should be something that one would like to have around for years. That is not, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, used something that has been, you know, actually, you know, a few years ago, uh, been written about because I said I find so many things today aggressively disagreeable. So, uh, you know, you look at many of the chairs and, you know, you just know you can't sit on them. They're, it's a pretty picture. 
But you have to, you know, furniture has a function. And it should be warm, it should make an interior more pleasant, it should be uh, something that you would like. I mean, usually it's a big investment too, and you would like to be able to live with these things comfortably and agree, you know, nicely for many years to come. And not just as a fad. But uh, do you have a favorite piece of furniture that you've? One? No. <laughs> No? I, have, I have a few that I like, but yeah, well, this is a piece of furniture too. Let <laughs> <laughs> me so, uh, turn to the audience and see if there are questions. Beavis, do you have a question? Well, the one thing I did mention, please, we never get to it, and I, I just mention before we go. Uh, I have, uh, you know, the last half of my life I've spent in my garden, and uh, it has become very important, you know, for me. And the one thing that uh, I sort of, when I started, when I was invited by uh, President Kerry to uh, come and be here, I started, uh, you know, thinking about a few things. And uh, I've spent all this time, and we talked about it, of, uh, you know, working inside, you know, in how, would it be houses or stores or different things. And everything which you do is really static to a degree. You, one controls it, one puts it there, and one changes it because you know, con conditions changes or need changes. And then I started doing the same thing outside. And it was very obvious that whatever you do outside, you cannot really control completely. And uh, it is nature that decides what it wants to do. And right now, I had the unfortunate experience. I've never had anything as true as this thought. Ten days ago, there was a storm. You know, I have a house in, in, uh, in Westchester. And I've taken good care of the garden. And we had the worst destruction I've ever had. I had trees down all over the place. I have, I'm going to have work to clean it up probably the next five months. So here was what I had thought, you know, sort of a fleeting nice thought here, philosophical. But that's the way it is. <laughs> so as great as gardening is and as wonderful it is and as much as I love it, but it takes care of us. You know, <laughs> we, we don't take care of them at all. So, yes, Mercy. Um, I have a question. You mentioned on the margin the Bauhaus, and I was wondering. Oh, or, and I was wondering to what extent you, in your training, were still perhaps through some teachers or whatnot, under the influence of the Bauhaus and even further back of the Wiener Werkstätte. Not, not really, because, you, you know, I do remember the Wiener Werkstätte a little bit, you know, because it was naturally very exciting. I mean, these things were always very exciting because they happened to be really very good in themselves, you know. And the, the Bauhaus uh, really didn't have that much influence then, you know, certainly, you know, I, not on, on, uh, on uh, myself. I think it had much later then because it was really the first really what one would uh, you know, consider a, a contemporary you know, movement. And obviously with enormous amount of influence because there was nothing quite like this before. You know, it was suddenly, suddenly again. And we today didn't talk really about uh, how much uh, you know, the influences and, uh, you know, and obviously it has been highly debated. A lot of people, you know, just did, you know, just could never live with it really and have decided it was, you know, a phase that, but it was a very, very important movement. And I think you, you know, would want to talk about this mm -hmm. a little bit more. Uh, it was, it was a great, you know. Well, but it, it, it also, it had an impact on the curriculum that you studied in Paris. 
interestingly, because the Bauhaus curriculum had impact on all of art and design education. Not it, really. Well, it, 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 if you look no, at the no, way it's structured in terms back, of you what, <laughs> what you studied, in terms of the drawing and the way that worked its way into the curriculum and the idea of making and the role of the Yeah, Well, the we had Jean-Michel Franck as one of yeah. the critics because, yeah. you know, part of the, uh, the third year, uh, we had some of the well-known decorators or designers or architects come and, uh, you know, talk about their work. And then we had to do, you know, a project, you know, a, a, the, the design a room, you know, what we thought, you know, to interpret their way of doing, which you probably do now, yep. the same thing. Yes, so we, I think the, mo the most extreme, we had Jean-Michel Franck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I did meet uh, uh, Malice Sebas. Really? Yes, I was in one of his houses actually then. Fantastic. Uh, but you know, one couldn't, one could not evaluate actually, you know, how important at the you know, time. At yeah. the time, yeah. no, no, it just was different. But uh, it was, uh, you know, one could not, uh, you know, I certainly had, had no, uh, you know, evaluation. Of it. it was, it was very, very different. Yes. Hello, Jennifer. Hello. I wonder if your concept of um, nobility of design can be applied to gardening as well. You said nature takes care of, it, care of us, but I wonder if we can impose something of nobility on gardening. Well, yes, and I do believe, I mean, it is, uh, you know, it is, you know, I've been told and I, you know, have learned now too that probably my garden seems to be a little bit different from most gardens that are out there because I was not, uh, you know, I never learned anything, you know, about landscaping in the sense that, you know, certain trees, uh, you know, are growing, you know, over 10 years that height and over five years this and all these things. I was totally uh, oblivious of that. And I just started putting things together that I, you know, decided look good. And somehow most of it learned how to live with each other in a way or not. I don't know if it was sheer luck again or, well, you know, because uh, in, in, in that sense, I think, Yes, yes. I think it has made a great difference. And, and I really you know, can say this today, I've never un you know, unfortunately learned enough about the basics that you know, I just did things and uh, you know, lived with it, had good advice here and there, uh, listened to most of the advice, not about everything, and, uh, but uh, it, it seemed to have worked because I've been gardening for 50 years now, and it's still there. I mean, it was greatly, you know, demolished last week, but, uh, you know, it's there. But it, 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 it has its own life. It has its own life, definitely. Beauty seems to be, you've surrounded yourself with beautiful things most of your life, have you not? I hope so. Well, yeah. I mean, present company accepted, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> but where did that come from? Where did it become? Because it seems to me it is important that you choose it. You decide to bring beautiful things into your life. It, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to say. You know, I, th I think what, you know, what's considered a fairly good taste. But, I, you know, but that's really in the eye of the beholder, you know, what some people might. I just know what I, for instance, my house that I put together 50 years ago, I've never felt I still have every piece of furniture that uh, I uh, put together then, and uh, I still have the same covers. I've never changed anything in my life, except objects of art or, or pictures we moved around and uh, the way we acquired you know, additional things. I've never changed anything. I never felt that I would like to, because I probably would have if I thought certain things didn't work. Uh, I live with the same things. 
And so obviously, you know, and it's been always a comfortable house. It's been, uh, you know, I, I can't explain this, you know. <laughs> well, they it know. is, it is. And what did you learn to write? Because your writing is quite, again, I, earlier I said that. No, I don't think I write very well. Oh, yes, you write very well. It's unfortunate we don't have uh, an overhead projector, and, 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 and perhaps a few more students that could see both the quality of the writing and the relationship between the writing and the, and the design that you did. Uh, which is, to my mind at least, quite good. And I just, well, thank so, you. Wh where well did you learn to write? On the job? <laughs> I told you I never went to school after the <laughs> classes. <laughs> so, uh, we, we traveled, rather, we uh, tra traveled quite extensively. And when we traveled the, uh, the, in the 60s, you know, I, uh, we traveled to the Orient, the Near Orient. The I got as far as Thailand in Asia. You know, I never got to China. I never got to Japan. Uh, we had some. We were in Nepal when Nepal still was, you know, a, a real country in the sense with its own. Uh, costumes, its own, uh, nothing had changed then. It was very early when uh, they allowed people in uh, who were not mountain climbers. I mean, if you were a mountain climber and had a whole expedition, you could go there. But that was in the uh, 60s. And actually, we, uh, my, you know, Billy, I think he would have become a mountain climber if he didn't have to make a living somewhere. And uh, so uh, it was a very important trip for us. We, uh, we camped out with some Sherpas, you know, not very high, but we, we uh, below the Annapurna range, and we flew over Everest. And uh, I would have liked probably to see the East more. I would have very much liked to see that, uh, which I haven't seen at all. And then I've never really traveled very much in America either, so there are lots of things that I haven't seen in this country that I would have liked to see. So, so now it's Rocky Hills to be taken care of, so that's one stays home, so. Um, Beavis. Oh, I have a, a question. Uh, in the, uh, you told Bloomingdale's you were going to, uh, you told Bloomingdale's you would leave um, uh, them for July and August. And uh, I think one day when I was in your garden, I heard the garden say that uh, you had so designed it that you, uh, the, that the garden would have to do without you and Billy for the same two months. Is that right? That, yeah. that it's a June garden and you were gone the rest well, there of the wasn't that, you know, there, there wasn't that much going on there that couldn't live by itself, you know, with somebody that came and, uh, uh, you know, don't forget that there was nothing there when we started out. So this was the first years there when there was much, much less to take care of. But it's so. a trick to design a garden that uh, can dispense with the designer for two summer months. Well, design, you know, I told you, I mean, you know, the weeds grow and, the, you know, so when weeds a little bit more afterwards, so it's not <laughs> a, <laughs> No, there wasn't that much, there wasn't that much there either. So, well, it survived, didn't it? You have seen it, right? It has survived. Yeah. It's been reinvented every year. Well, one has to do a few few things new, right? And one gets carried away. One sees wonderful things here and there, so one has to try. So. Are you going to rebuild it from the destruction? Are you going to clean it up? And Well, you have to, you know, some of it, it just, but you see uh, what a garden does. Uh, you know, I have, for instance, in the back of my house, I had some special plants uh, that uh, like shade. And uh, there's a huge tree on top. I have no more shade. So I have to move these plants, because they happen to be some very special plants, and get them somehow, the, you know, the right <coughs> environment, because they could not survive this way. And there's no way of putting a fairly large tree there, because they're, you know. Uh, so yes, you know, 
as I said, it makes us change. You know, we don't you always change things. It is the God that, that keeps on changing. So. Did, did Billy's art and his work affect your design? No, no, not really. Well, it's just that I, I think I, I saw uh, looking at things and, you know, and the way we wear uh, and the things, you know, that I was exposed to. I mean, there were, for instance, uh, times that, uh, you know, I had to think about all these things now because the last few, few days, for instance, uh, I was privy, you know, to spend three days uh, at the Louvre. Uh, when they were hanging the largest Poussin exhibit, you know, this very well-known French painter. Uh, and uh, the, you know, we, we happen, he, he happened to know the director, he happened to know, uh, you know, a lot of the, the experts. And, and so here there, there was really the top of all the Poussin experts together there, and they were hanging that huge show. So to spend three days in, you know, t listening to all the experts and debating, you know, is this because you dig out all sorts of things in corners, you know, that people have never seen or debated, you know, what is this? And by the way, the great uh, Poussin expert was Anthony Blunt, who was the, you know, some of you, you know, might hear have heard about him. He was, at that time, what is called the Queen's uh, picture keeper. He took care of the Queen's, uh, the English Queen's uh, paintings. And he turned out, he was a wonderful, you know, gentleman at that time. And he turned out to be one of the third of the famous English-Russian spies. So, <laughs> so, but that's just a nice thing, aside from <laughs> Did, did the FBI so, ever tap your phone to find out? You, uh, <laughs> These were yeah. different times. Then, so. I understood that your mother was quite an elegant woman, and uh, I wonder what her focus was artistically, and how that influenced you, or did it? Well, I suppose we always saw, you know, you know, nice things around. For instance, she was uh, a person that. Uh, uh, had, uh, you know, she, she adored good clothes. And for instance, uh, she started wearing, you know, in, in her, you know, her time in the 30, you know, f you know 30s and, uh, uh, you know, usually even the best of couturiers in Paris, never, everything had to be made out of silk or, or fur. Well, there was a very famous lady called Madame Vionnet who invented basically the bias cut. And uh, she is uh, today one of the famous uh, capes that she made, evening capes. And I gave that to the Metropolitan Museum. And occasionally it's coming out. I've already seen it twice over the years. And it is a big beige wool cape. It's wool. And it's called the spy cape because the spy where the the uh, the big uh, you know the in the foreign legion they had uh, uh, some of the African uh, the soldiers you know and the, who ride the camels out there and there were these big capes well it was inspired by that and it's a big beige cape it's wool and inside was black velvet and then it has a hood a black velvet hood and a tassel that hangs from the top all the way down. Well, nobody, you know, decided one wears wool in the evening. My mother always decided you wear fur inside. You don't fur, wear fur outside. It's outside, it doesn't do any good. You wear fur because you want it warm, so it's inside. So, you know, so, I mean, she, I'm quite sure, has rubbed off a lot. Yes. Yes. So, she just was, uh, you know. No. Have, we, have we forgot to ask you anything that you... Well, there's a lot of other things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I dug those like all out. What do you think? I've been thinking about all this thing all the time. No. <laughs> yeah, do you have recommendations for designers today? Yeah. If you were going to pursue a, a, a career in interior design today or design in general, that you would tell them yeah. beyond the earlier comments, which were quite eloquent? 
Well, you know, it's very, very difficult because there's so much today and, you know, one doesn't even like to, you know, be a critic of things. Uh, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of things that, you know, are really just, you know, made for obsolescence, really. Is it, you know? fair, I mean, uh, is it a, an accurate restatement of what you were talking about earlier that uh, design uh, is not just technical work that uh, one needs to have a complete education and experience and um, see things beyond just uh, how to cut, how to make, how to do the technical side of the, of the Not necessarily. Technically, no. I think you don't necessarily have to know how to build a piece of furniture. Yes, that's what I mean. Or how to do. I don't think you have to do that. But I think you have to have an understanding of, uh, you know, what, what goes together, uh, what, uh, you know, how to assemble things. Yes, yes. But the, but the acquisition of the capacity to say, uh, this is good, this is noble, and this is not good, this is not noble, this is temporary, this is timeless, the acquisition of that capability. Uh, well, you have it or you don't. I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure that you're, I think your story is different than that. I think you got some of it from your mother. I think your travels, your relationship with Billy, I think. Well, the influence, naturally. I think one is enormously influenced by the people one meets, by the people uh, one has a relationship to, by somebody who uh, inspires you. Right. You know, these things do rub off. I mean, there's no question about that. But it yeah. took courage to go to India when you went to India. It took something other than just luck to be kind to somebody who was able to help you. It took, you know, some, you know, it, it took a spirit of, uh, you know, willingness to do adventurous and risky things to travel the way that you and Billy travel. Well, the, you know, the only thing, you know, one can think that, uh, you know, all the stories usually one hears about a country or something mm -hmm. that puts you off, or, you know, people say, well, you can't travel here, you can't travel there, Everybody, you're going to get sick, and, you, you know, don't touch the food. Well, you know, I think one has to use common sense uh, very often and, uh, you know, go explore, because the wonderful thing is, that there are different cultures out there, and that people live differently, and uh, you know one doesn't always have to be necessarily uh, of you know once even you see it or you ex explore the thing, uh, you know you don't necessarily have to be uh, you know ex espouse their you know their you know starting with religion, right? You just respect what they're doing and. Uh, you tr you know you try to learn something from but, them somewhere. I mean, but, one, but, but one you, has to have a I think a, a sense that one is interested in other people, that one is interested in other cultures. But you lived uh, an unusual life by choice in many ways, right? You you were both a part of society, but outside of society, you were not. Probably yes. Yeah. Yes. And yes. that's a choice. A choice. Yes. Right. And it, it, uh, it's, it seems to suggest that uh, a, uh, not just a good designer, but somebody who wants to live a healthy life, uh, which I think you've done. And I think the I think extraordinary so. thing about your life is how, how healthy and balanced it, certainly from, from what I've seen, appears to have been. Uh, so it requires both living, you know, according to uh, the rules of society, but picking a few things that are well, one has different. to live in you know yeah. in, in in the bounds of a society. Right. I mean, one can't be so extravagant that you know one can't. Well, right, but you need a little fit. extravagance. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. I think so, and I think one has should be determined about certain things. You know, to to try to see them through, and. Uh, you know, you can't, you know, just be a follower all the time. Right. But, and also, you just said it again when I introduced the evening. I was very impressed um, by the way you do your work, the thoroughness, the preparation. That uh, you're not born with. 
<laughs> well, you know, except for what I would like to do, I would like to do properly. I mean, it would have been foolish for me to get and here I'm, and have forgotten everything I did. You know, if you think I'm, I can go I'm to remember to, everything. I'm willing to say that your genes are coded for, three, for being able to see in three-dimensional, but, <laughs> but after that, I'm not sure. Yes. I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering whether you think there's hope Given the change in the world lately, there's hope that planned obsolescence might be on its way out. Well, I don't think it will ever be complete. You know, there's no such thing. I don't think, unfortunately, there's no such thing. It would be a nice thing. It would be a nice thing, but I don't think so. Yeah, there's a lot of landfills in America that say just the opposite. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just in answer to that question about what could she say for the students, I think the thing that uh, is remo most remarkable about Henrietta is that she's a work in progress. You know, she never quits asking questions. She never quits the inquisitive, want wanting to know, finding out about things that affect her, affect the world. And I think that it's a great example for us all as we look out and say, you know, at her age, at all she's accomplished, but every day is a new adventure. Every day she's looking for something new and a uh, great example. Well, here this is a dear friend of mine who, by the way, you know, when he, you know, we met many years ago when I started, when after I left Bloomingdale's and uh, he worked in uh, one of the Federated stores and I, you know, was hired to come and put order down there. So we met many years ago. And uh, his name is Frank Watson, and he became, you know, after I'd stopped working, after Billy died, uh, he became president of Lord and Taylor. And he asked me, you know, now you go out and put the gift shop together for us. This was my last fling in, in working, and uh, I hope I didn't disappoint him. So. <laughs> In the same vein as, as he just said, Henriette, I just want to say that you're certainly an inspiration to me and I'm sure to many people here. And just a, a question also, did you and Billy equally design the garden or was one of you more No, it was, force? you know, it was, you know, a mutual, it was a, a mutual, you know, a, you know, affair. And unfortunately, he never saw it, you know, he, you know, he, he uh, died 26 years ago, so there's a lot he hasn't seen. But I still think, you know, I think he would have liked what's there. I think so. Yes. Your home, um, since you've traveled so much and your taste is so elegant and wonderful, um, what is your home like with, the, with all your travels? Is it loads of things? Is it spacious, opened? I mean, uh, you know, you obviously have such a passion for beauty. How could you limit yourself in, when you were furnishing your home, which you said is still filled with things that you've loved from the very start? Yeah, well, all my furniture, all my, you know, all that's ex exactly, you know, that it, what it was. You know. Is it very eclectic? Yeah, I think so. I have some Gibbings chairs. I have some Finial chairs. And now, not the not the handmade ones. It, you know, these were the machine-made ones. And uh, I have uh, quite a few pieces of actually Norwegian 18th-century peasant furniture mm. uh, because I'm in the country, and uh, they they had they made rather elegant pieces. And uh, so it is a, a total mix of things, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I've even some Gibbings, uh, you know, I don't know. There, there was a time when he uh, sort of departed a little bit from his classic things, and uh, there was a couple of pieces that I, that I thought very, very beautiful, the strap things, you know, yeah. that he did, the Mexican, you know. This. So it's, it's different things, and they all have worked. And... Uh, there was no real, you know, I could do different today, but there's really no reason to change anything. Uh, and I have a few old pieces. I have a few 18th century French pieces. And uh, there's, uh, it's, it's a mixture of things. Sounds wonderful. Well, for classic design, you know, there was this famous uh, library chair, Regency English library chair. Nobody has ever designed, you know, that that folds up with a ladder. You know, it's a ladder and it's a chair. It, uh, it's, 
it's been around for 200 years and nobody has ever designed a better library chair. So, you know, and it's, it served a purpose, so it's there. And it's there. It's there. Um, I'd just like to speak for a lot of us who have been to Henrietta's home. And there is a word that has not been said today, which I think Henrietta represents, and that's elegance. But elegance in a warm and wonderful way that makes her house not only elegant, but cozy and comfortable. Thank you. That's and I've to, just, one, yes, I, just to follow up on that, um, I think something that people here would be really intrigued with is the way Henriette utilizes things of beauty that you wouldn't normally use to decorate with. I remember the first time being in her house seeing how she used pearls and and throws and things. Do you want to tell them what how how you display pearls? Well, you know, the, my dresser, I have, you know, like, a, you know, a kind of uh, uh, shell there, you know, and so I put all the, you know, the pearl strings when it's accumulated over a long lifetime, right? So then putting in a drawer, it's just very nice to look at, so that's, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. Oh, <laughs> well, here, that put there. On the, on the doors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I used to knit at one time, so I made a lot, you know, the, with, you, television came very late to our, you know, in our <laughs> life. So uh, the, the, when it came and when they had to, you know, sort of, you know, it's very easy, one can make scarves, you know, big scarves, you don't have to count anything. So I made innumerable scarves. <laughs> And then uh, years ago, when one sat on airports, we, you know, we started flying when one had to go via Gander or, you know, went to get to Europe. We did go every year. It took forever. I used to do more knitting, which you can't do today, right? Today, I have to take my hat pin off to get on the plane. <laughs> Not to speak to come with knitting needles, you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> with knitting needles or something. Mm -hmm. So I have all these things hanging around. Yes, that's true. <laughs> the, uh, well, I want to pay a tribute uh, to, to Henriette. Um, I've heard her speak uh, both tonight but also er earlier about her work environment <laughs> starting in the 40s. Um, and that environment was a, to a total male dominated uh, almost uh, to the exclusion of women. Um, and uh, so I, I would pay you this kind of tribute. It seems to me you are a um, post women's lib woman who uh, established yourself as such in a pre women's lib time. Uh, I mean, when you speak of, you know, uh, having 90 employees in Macy's when you're starting out in the 40s, it's just a throwaway line. I mean, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, many women would, would uh, rhapsodize over that for a while. It is, so uh, you just take, you, somehow you took for granted your uh, success and accomplishments in, in a man's world. So I find that remarkable and uh, laudatory. <laughs> Well, it was sort of a natural thing to do. I don't know, you know, it was, uh, you know, it isn't this. It wasn't anything that I've, you know, I have some, you know, I can now because we, I obviously at my time, there were many discussions over the years about the role of women, you know, and uh, when the women's lib came in, you know, very, very uh, strongly and, uh, I have always felt, and I st have never changed my mind, that I think for equal job, for equal work done, and for equal job, we should be paid exactly the same way. And I think there is a difference, and luckily there is a difference between men and between women. And I believe that there are certain things that women, you know, can't do and they shouldn't do. And uh, the, I have, uh, uh, you know, w women have other, uh, another role to play. 
you know, and uh, so, but, you know, everybody can, you know, if you're a bookkeeper, you know, certain things, women don't have the same strength, the, you know, just physical strength and things. And there are certain jobs that, they, you know, that are not, they're not fit for them. And, I, and I'm even sure that probably even uh, running the top, 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 uh, you know, uh, big businesses, you know, you know, a, a woman is, you know, has to keep house, she has to, you know, and uh, she, you know, she has to do other things. So she can come practically to the top, yes. But, uh, you know, certain things, I just feel, I've always felt, you know, and what I've seen over the years, I don't think, you know, has ever changed my mind. Well, that could provoke several hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I know, um, I know, yes. I know. It's very appropriate that we're uh, honoring you today in a school environment because you are a great unsung educator. And um, I happen to know that you, um, during your career at Bloomingdale's, you brought people from the Frick to speak to the buyers and the other people that worked for you. And you continue to educate us with lectures in the garden and, 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 tell, and showing the most casual visitor um, things they might not have thought about or seen before when they come to visit you. So I know this is just a comment. It's not a, it's not a qu uh, question, perhaps, but it's, but it's very appropriate that you're here today. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank the audience very much for your participation.